You've probably heard this before, this quote, either from Pastor Veronica or from me or from some other preacher, but the theologian Karl Barth famously said that one's task is to preach with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. And the newspaper the past few Sundays, but especially this morning, is heavy. As all of us are aware, there was some big news that came out on Friday. The verdict in the Kyle Rittenhouse case was announced. We know that about 15 months ago, this young man drove across state lines with a firearm that he could not legally purchase for himself and killed two Black Lives Matter protesters and injured a third. And he was acquitted on all accounts. And that's heavy to hold this morning. As a clergy person, as someone who took ordination vows, as your pastor, I get the privilege and the honor. I really do think it is an honor to speak from this pulpit. But it's not always easy. I spend... The week, and especially I've spent the past few days thinking about what God needs us to hear. And I am called to do that even when it's hard, maybe especially when it's hard. And so this morning, I believe that part of my role is to acknowledge that this was white supremacy working exactly as it was designed to work. It can be seen in the makeup of the jury. It can be seen in the actions of the judge. It can be seen in the verdict. And I'm called to acknowledge that that causes hurt and trauma and pain for so many people. And that it further compounds the grief that so many of us are already feeling. And I am called to be very clear when I say that white supremacy is not of God. It's not of God. It is kin to that temptation that the devil offered Jesus in the wilderness, the temptation of this perverse power over other people. And so, as we are called to do in all things, we have to follow Jesus and reject it. That is our role to play as people of faith, to continue to reject racism and oppression and white supremacy in all of its forms. I am disturbed by the verdict. I'm disturbed by the trial. I am disturbed by the events that led up to it. I am disturbed by the knowledge that teenagers and adults of color do not receive anything close, anything close to equivalent treatment in our courthouses. The words of Psalm 13 come to my mind. How long, O Lord? How long must we have sorrow? How long, O Lord? Sometimes it feels like the world is ending. Perhaps that's why the book of Revelation has been in my spirit all month. An unsettling text for unsettling times. I know that it might seem, given everything that has happened, a little odd to preach on wellness this morning, but I don't know about you. I need it. We need it. And I know that it might seem equally, if not more odd, to end our wellness series with a scripture from Revelation of all places. The book of Revelation can be kind of scary, what with the horsemen of the apocalypse and the number of the beast and the plagues, but I'd actually like to suggest that Revelation is secretly one of the most hopeful books in the Bible. 
It's certainly one of the most creative books in the Bible with incredibly vivid imagery that has inspired artwork, hymns, and even best-selling book series. So the question and the task before us this morning, Hyde Park Union Church, is how do we get to hope? How do we get from here to hope? And how can the book of Revelation help us get there? First, I think we have to understand the genre of this book. Revelation is both an apocalypse and a letter. And yes, apocalypse is a genre. Revelation is probably the most famous example, but it's far from the only one. The book of Daniel in the Hebrew Bible is an apocalypse. And there were many apocalypses circulating around the same time as Revelation. In other words, it was popular. It's still popular. And think of all the dystopian fiction bestsellers of the past 50 years. Is anyone else a dystopian fiction fan? Oh, just me. Well, I can tell you about a few of them that I've read if you're in the mood. The Handmaid's Tale, The Parable of the Sower, The Hunger Games, Station Eleven, all bestsellers. And this sort of writing gains popularity, usually in times of unrest. There's a reason it was popular then, and there's a reason it is popular now. In Apocalypse, it speaks to fear and anxiety, but... It also can move beyond those. And I think a good apocalypse moves beyond those. Because apocalypse as a genre is really about vision, about developing and communicating a new perspective on the world. And that is exactly what the book of Revelation does. We also need to know that the book of Revelation is a letter. Just like Paul's letters to churches, the book of Revelation is also a letter. It is written by a leader in the Johannan Christian community to the seven churches of Asia. These churches, they're located in what we now call Turkey. And at that time, they were in various stages of conflict with the Roman Empire. And these communities, like any community, included all sorts of people. So John is writing to all sorts of people, people who are being oppressed by the empire, people who are pretty good with the status quo, and people who had positions of power. The author is articulating for all of them an apocalypse or a new vision, a vision of how to live as the church in difficult and troubled times. We too live in troubled times. We live in a time of plague and political unrest. We live in a time of oppression and injustice. We live on the precipice of environmental disaster and collapse. We live in some pretty troubled times, which is why we have been talking about wellness for the past several weeks. And it's why I think we need the words of an apocalyptic letter this morning, not because the world is ending, but because the world is changing and laboring. And we need the hope that it takes to labor along with it. We won't go through the entire book of Revelation this morning. You are welcome. But if you read the full text, you'll notice that Revelation travels along these two different tracks. On one track is the dominant world view, the world as seen from the perspective of empire. On the other track is the world from God's eyes, from the perspective of the divine. And as events play out in Revelation, you see them on both of those tracks. And in doing that, Revelation offers us a side-by-side -side comparison of how to look at the world. 
allowing us to see things as they are and to see things as God is working for them to be. So that's how I want us to look at the portion of today's text that Alice read for us so beautifully. I want us to look at it with that understanding, knowing that the author is giving us a chance to see things differently, offering us a way to see things through God's perspective. The letter, as any good letter does, opens with a greeting. Grace to you and peace from the one who is and who was and who is to come. It starts with a simple yet powerful statement. God is. God is. Take that in. God is. God is here right now. I think that John started with that. He could have put those in any order. The one who is the one who was and who is to come. But he started with God is, I think, because John knew that the people needed to be reminded that God is. We are connected to God right now. God is not somewhere beyond us or apart from us or only in the past of us. God is. This truth is at the heart of so much, it's especially at the heart of the work of Christian contemplatives like Richard Rohr. I know that many of you are Richard Rohr fans. I love when I get the daily Rohr meditations forwarded to me by some of you. So I, I know that some of you are fans, but if you don't know who that is, he's a Franciscan friar who founded this place called the Center for Action and Contemplation. And if you follow his work, he has been writing all year on the theme of unveiling. Richard Rohr has said, this past year is unveiling some things. It is peeling back some things and showing us despair and suffering and brokenness. And God still is in the unveiling. And in this roar has encouraged those who read his work to see it all, to open oneself to the knowledge that even now we are one with God and one with one another. Two tracks, right? The dominant perspective that says that we are alone and that we do not matter. The divine perspective that says, no, we're not even separate from God. We are one with God and we are held in a great love. We always have been and we always will be. It's a good place to start a letter. <laughs> and it continues. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of kings on earth. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom. Priests to his God and creator. To him be glory and power forever and ever. The author's next step is to remind us who exactly Jesus is. And what Jesus has done. John knows that first the people need to be reminded that God is, and that then maybe they need to be reminded who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. So he says Jesus is the human son of God who fully experienced the reality of embodied life. Jesus is a faithful witness who sees what's going on, who sees the good wonderful things, and who bears witness to the unwellness in the world. And Jesus, as the Christ, has transformed it, has transformed the world and each of us through his re resurrection. Jesus has shown us that death is not the final word. 
We're about to enter the season where we start with Jesus as an infant, but remember that his life showed us that death is not the final word. He's shown us that oppression and perverted systems of justice are not the final word. He has shown us that despair is not the final word. And John goes on and says that Jesus wants us to be part of it. Jesus has made this community a church and we are priests in it. We are part of the transformation. Jesus, the son of God, wants us as co-workers, us as co-creators, fellow gardeners of this beloved community. Again, we have two tracks. The dominant track that either refuses to see things the way they are or says that there's no way out of it. And then the divine perspective that acknowledges when things are wrong. And that says it is being transformed. And I want you to help. This portion of the letter goes on and concludes, I am the Alpha and Omega says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. There it is again, the statement that God is here even now, stretching from Alpha to Omega, from A to Z, from end to end, and back around again. The book of Revelation, believe it or not, has a theology of more. A theology of more, not in the capitalist sense of more, or the human sense of more, or the American culture sense of more, where happiness only comes when you have more things, or you have more wealth, or you have more status. Revelation's theology of more is different. It says, with God, there is always more. There is more love. There is more connection. There is more justice. There is more liberation. There is more life. There is more hope. Again, we see those two tracks, right? The dominant perspective that says there's not enough for everyone. So either work really hard or just give up now. And the divine perspective that says, oh, my loves, there is abundance. Revelation offers us hope by putting these two perspectives side by side. It allows us to see differently. And if we can see differently, we can live differently. And that is so powerful. That is revolutionary. If we can see differently, we can live differently. If we can see that there is love and connection, we can live in love and connection. If we see that there is transformation, we can live transformation. If we can see that there is more, that there is abundance, then we can live in abundance. If we can see that there is hope, we can live in hope. And hope, my friends, is important for wellness. Hope is important for our wellness. But remember that hope is not just a feeling. I think that is sometimes where we can get stuck. We think that we have to feel it, but hope is not just a feeling. You do not have to feel hopeful to be hopeful. There's an author and an activist I like named Miriam Kaba, and she talks about hope as a discipline. And she says this is actually something that she learned from a nun. And this nun told her about this practice that she has of choosing hope each and every day. And Mary Ibn Kaba talks about how she heard this nun say that and thought, yeah, that's what I needed to hear. 
And Miriam Kaba talks about how that's how she lives her life every day with this discipline of hope. She says, hope doesn't preclude feeling sadness or frustration or anger or any other emotion. Because all of those are valid emotions to feel. Hope is not the same as optimism. Hope is a philosophy of living, a discipline that we have to practice. We can be people of hope if we choose it and if we practice it. That's, again, what Revelation offers us. Two tracks, two visions. And we can choose. We can choose how we're going to orient ourselves to the world around us. It's not always an easy choice, but we can choose it. We can choose to see ourselves and others and the world differently. We can choose to see it through the lens of the divine. And if we can see it differently, we can live it differently. And if we live it differently, we will change the world. Not all at once. We might not even see the ways that we change it. We might not be around for the ways that we have changed it, but trust me when I say it will make a difference. Even if it just makes a difference in one other person's life that you know, it makes a difference. Living well makes a difference. Living abundantly makes a difference. Living in hope makes a difference. Let us practice it each and every day. Amen. Amen.